So <clears throat> I thank everybody for coming here tonight to see Jeremiah and, and Heather off on their missions journey. Uh, I know it's been a long, long time coming with uh, doing the itineration, ups and downs, and lots of miles traveled. Lord have mercy. <laughs> um, we do have a, a few little things for you guys and for the boys. Yeah, you guys can come up here. I already, I'm glad you came up here because I already forgot what's what. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Just a little something to, to remember. Oh my word! But it's clean. You may fix that. I need to season it up. <laughs> Yours only holds decaf, though. No. <laughs> I'll test it and see. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. I love you. So I'm sure that there's many stories and many memories here in this room tonight, and uh, I've I've got a lot. <laughs> I've got a lot. Well, maybe one or two. Myself. No. <laughs> I don't. I don't have any stories in particular. I just wanted to tell you all congratulations, and we wish you guys the best on your missions trip, and we will always be here for you guys. We love you. All right. Good evening. Well, now he told me that I'm supposed to start in, in our normal, pres normal presentation, I'm supposed to introduce the family. I don't think I need to do that. Y'all saw Scotty as big as I am. Um, he's now 14. Yes, and he's very happy. Typical 14-year-old mind and everything, you know, the brain shuts off. And then, you know exactly. And then Robbie is now 10, and um, he's headed that way. But we, we so, um, I'm not going to cry. I'm going to be good. We, it's so good to be home. It's so good to be home tonight. Y'all have seen, um, y'all have watched many of you through our Facebook stuff. <laughs> over the last couple of years a lot of fun but we truly we truly appreciate the prayers and okay okay I had since we didn't oh I finally get to do whatever I want so we haven't even <laughs> we have not even put it out done one of how many of y'all watch our silly live videos yeah okay we haven't even done one of these yet because he was having a guy's night with his dad and brothers last night. And um, I could have done it with the boys. It's just not the same without him. So yesterday, we got the official email that we knew we were 100% funded before then for the last couple of weeks. But we were waiting on um, all the I's to be dotted, T's to be crossed, and to get our official clearance. And we got the email about four o'clock yesterday afternoon. So yay! So that means that we could now buy our airline tickets. And so we got the clearance and then we immediately started looking for flights. And we are happy to announce, we're excited, we're nervous, all the gamut of emotions, that we will be leaving um, for Curacao on April the 24th, which is two weeks from yesterday, and please pray for us. For one, our flight leaves at 6.55 a.m., so that's a big thing. But no, seriously, if y'all would pray with us that all of our luggage makes it, that we make it safely, and we have an apartment rented, and we are ready to start the next journey that God has for us. Yes. Awesome. Thank I, I'll, make up, I'll, I'll make up for my time for music here. I'll keep it short. Um, but uh, stop it, stop it, 
it's it's relative. Um, so uh, the other testimony we uh, we found out we we are, we don't we can't send a uh, a container shipping container down. So we we have to pack everything in bags. We're kind of worried about that because bags get really expensive. We're like Jesus, how are we gonna do this? This this organization we found that helped. Here's here's a major testimony. Uh, through this organization, we we can they've worked out a deal with the airlines. We each get three free bags a piece. That's huge. So that means the boys and I each get one and Heather gets nine. <laughs> Come on. Y'all know that. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I need an extra one. Just, I'm not taking all my shoes. But we are, we are so grateful. Um, two quick things to say. Uh, first, um, to, to Pastor Jonathan and Julie. And um, he, he, like I said, you've already taken the offering, so it's, you know it's, it's not bribery here. But uh, this, is, this is huge. For, for a pastor to invite a former pastor back to, to speak and to, to have this opportunity to share, that's huge. Uh, that, that speaks to what, a, what an incredible man and woman of God you've got leading this church. And um, I am, I'm so thankful. We've had a few opportunities to sit down and talk, and I, I've heard his heart, and I'm so excited. Uh, when, we, when we left, we said we knew God had in mind the right person to take Bethel to the next step and beyond. And, and I truly believe with all my heart is this couple sitting right here. Because the skills and the gifts and the talents that God has put in them um, is, is what is needed to move forward beyond anything we even dreamed. I mean, I walked in today, I'm like, Lord of mercy. <laughs> when I fixed the back wall, I told John this, when I fixed the back wall, it looked like a drunk monkey had been loose in this church. And, and then they, I'm like, man, this is awesome. And, and just, you see what well, I no, no, when you look, you see stuff happening, you know things. And, and I'm just so thankful. And I, I sneak every now and then and watch the messages and sermons. And I don't know how you, 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 you say all that you do in such an amazing time limit. <laughs> That's all I've heard from people. He gets us out on time. Oh, my goodness, for you gripe and complain. For seven years, I just made sure you were going to heaven. <laughs> get used to an all-day worship service. You're gonna be, you ain't going to be surprised when you get to heaven. But now, <laughs> man, you're making me look really bad. But, um, but no, I am, I am so honored and thankful to be here, and thank you. And I, and I hope if there's folks, you know, I, we'll see fam, a lot of family here. But if you know folks that ain't got a church home, get, them, get, get their butts in the chairs because they, they will be blessed and encouraged. One last thing in testimony. We're, we're going, uh, for some some know, some don't, we are going to work in the island of Curacao. Uh, just throw that one slide up. We'll be working there with kids and youth, this little bitty island. We got a chance to go two weeks ago, exploratory trip, got to meet people, found out they got mosquitoes the size of camels. Um, you know, and we got there. We went two days without our luggage, which in tropical heat, can't turn them around that many times. Um, and so it was, it was, but here's, here's the cool thing. We're going to be going down to help mobilize the church there and throughout that region to reach kids and youth. And, uh, you know, you always wonder, God, are we on the right track? Praise the Lord. We got, you, you didn't tell me you went Kojic. Got drummers playing behind a preacher. Come on. I love it. Uh, what, you know, is this the right track? Well, that Sunday we got to preach and minister in the church there. And, uh, after we got done, they had a little fellowship time after we went to meet folks. And um, there was a n very nice gentleman, um, kind of, uh, he came over and greeted us, and, and we were talking. He, he said, we're so excited to have you here. I want you to meet my wife. She comes over, and uh, his wife is the governor of Curacao. And uh, here, hold this, because I might get excited, and I won't throw coffee. And, you know, you still, you go through this, man, I, I left an incredible church you know, folks, I've, I've told this everywhere I go, and I said this here when, the last time we preached. You know, seven years pastoring, you run off everyone who doesn't like you. And so it's a good place to pastor. And then we left. But we knew it was of God because membership grew when we left. But anyhow, so, uh, you know, I'm moving my family. I'm giving up. I mean, it's just great. Lord, but do we know? So the governor, she came over, a very sweet woman of God. And, and one of those church grandma handshakes, she reached, she greets Heather, and, and she grabs my hand, you know, that two-handed pull you in, because church grandma wants you to know she loves you, she wants to tell you something, and she pulled me in, she looked me straight in the eye, 
And she said, you're a five-year answer to prayer. And I just kind of looked at her. She said, for five years, we have met every Friday morning and prayed that someone would come to help us reach our youth and break the back of fatherlessness in our island. And you are five years answer to prayer. Folks, I'm telling you what, I was just standing there crying and going, are you kidding? She said, the minute you get back, we want you and your wife to come and sit with us with pastor time and sit with us and together to dream what God can do through our kids. So I'm, I'm excited. We're going to meet with them. And here, here's the only reason why is because of y'all. You were willing to let us go. You were willing to... This church is, was our very first supporter and our most faithful. So many individuals as well. Because you said we believe in the call of God on your life. For five answers, now you're the answer to prayer to reach an entire generation. So thank you. We love you guys. We got more prayer card stuff. I'm going to stop because I'm, I'm going to cry. If you haven't signed up for a newsletter, you can do that. But hey, thank you. Thank you. And hey, Am I good? Yeah. All right. I, uh, you know, I was talking with my wife. I said, you know, it's real funny because I, I thought about it. I was like, not many pastors do invite back former pastors, but I just felt so comfortable with you. I love you, man. I'm going to go into our text messages here and read a text message from you from September. <laughs> Everybody, this is going to be totally worth the wait. I promise you, I should have had it saved up, but. All right. <laughs> On Sunday, September 17th, this was like the beginning of the laughing between the two of us. He texted me, hey, how did Philadelphia do today? <laughs> we lost to the Chiefs that day. I said, we played well, lost to the better team. No one thought we could hang. We did for three and a half quarters. And then I said, not the answer you were expecting, huh? He said, yes, yeah, sounds so full of grace. You almost took the fun out of it. <laughs> All I know is on February 4th, my team played and yours didn't. <laughs> that's, where, that's where I was, man. I was just... It was a setup. I've been, I've been holding on to that for months and months and months. <laughs> but anyway, uh, there's, uh, there's two things I want to say real quick. Um, there were a couple people who couldn't be here tonight, and uh, I'm going to read one because it was from a guy, and then I'm going to have my wife read one because it's from a woman, and I don't have a woman's tone. <laughs> so um, <laughs> Jeff Thompson was really upset he couldn't be here tonight, so he, uh, he, wrote, he wrote these two things for me to read. So he said, to Scotty. He said, thank you for being my daughter's friend. Thank you for having the love and courage to invite her to church. Without that one act of kindness, my family and I would have never found our church home. And then he said, to Pastor Jeremiah, for over 40 years I wandered and I wondered. I suspected there could be a God, but was equally suspicious at the lack of proof. Shortly after we began attending, you preached about the Holy Spirit. Your words opened my eyes, ears, heart, and mind in a way that has changed my life forever. The proof is everywhere. God guides us, warns us, even scolds us. Most of all, he loves us. I know that now with no doubt or disbelief whatsoever, and I want to thank you for that. It is so hard to write this without crying, and in fact, he was in tears when I talked to him after. He said, I owe my soul to Jesus, but I will forever be grateful that you allowed yourself to be the vessel he wanted you to be. I love you, my brother. Farewell, and God bless you. And then this is from Lynn, who is at Kidman. She says, as I sit here at Kidman, you're not here, by the way. I'm pondering the years you served as our pastor, thinking of all the amazing gifts God has given each of you. Jeremiah, I don't know where to begin. God has gifted you with so many talents. Remember that he called you. He is your strength, courage, healer. God is your everything. Heather, sweet Heather, a smile and warm loving hug brightened my Sundays. Someone who listened and would pray for me if needed. Scotty and Robbie, sniff. You will always be my boys. I was blessed to get to be a part of your lives and see the call God has for both of you. Embrace your new adventure. I will be praying for all of you. Love you all. Thank you. So tonight is a night of celebration. It's a night of sending. 
I know that tears will be shed, not just my tears because I got sweat in my eyes as I led worship. <laughs> I don't know what was going on. If anybody was watching my face, I, it was bad. My eyes were burning, burning, burning. But, um, but it's, just, it's a night of memories, but it's also more important than that. It's a night of sending off. You know, you gave, as you said before, you gave seven years of your life to this church, to this community, and uh, you just see the impact on the leaders, but also on the ministries. Um, you know, Bethel Assembly, you know, our, our, our vision right now is that we're going to be a church of many united as one, but that was championed first by you in the way that you set things up and the importance of the family, the importance of children's ministries, the importance of bringing everyone together. And so, I look at myself, and I've, you know, when I remember sitting in Bible college, and a lot of times people try to compare ministry, and they say, a lot of people say, ministry is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And uh, the way that it was relayed to me it was he said, no, it's not a sprint, it's not a marathon, it's a relay race. He said, we're all picking up somebody's baton, and we're all handing it off to somebody else. And you handed it off to me, and you're picking up somebody else's baton. You may be picking up the first baton based on what I'm hearing tonight. And, uh, you know, you get, it's exciting to see what God is doing in his kingdom. You know, I may get this wrong, and I did this off the top of my head, but while you were here, it was connect, develop, deploy, impact, correct? Yeah, all right, I did, all right. The banners were there. They're changed now. But <laughs> I remember, I remember, <laughs> I remembered them because I came in and I, I preached, and I was like, you know, that's, that's really good. And, you know, I, I think it's really interesting because you came here and you connected for seven years. You developed, as we all do as leaders, we all know we're always developing. By the way, if you think you're fully developed, then you're dead. So, <laughs> you know, you, you were developed in those seven years, and God is now deploying you, and we're deploying you. We're sending you out today to make that impact out in Curacao. And I'm, I'm excited because I know that this is a new beginning. It's a transition. It's not an end. You guys understand that? It's not an end. It's a transition into something new, into something exciting. And so my encouragement to all of you tonight, I'm going to share briefly. Um, as, I, as he said, I like to give a lot of things in a very short period of time. That way, hopefully, you take something away with you. My message tonight is for them. My message tonight is for you. Um, the, reality of the, situ the reality of the matter is as followers of Jesus, we are all called to something. We're all called to step out in our faith in some way. For some people, it is full-time ministry, vocational ministry. By the way, we're all called a full-time ministry. I shouldn't have said that first. We are all called a full-time ministry. Some of us are called to vocational ministry. And so tonight, as I talk about these things, my encouragement to you is, listen, don't just put it on them, but take it upon your heart as well, as I know that would be his heart as well. You know, this, when I think about what this week and these coming days represent, you know, I saw, it was your Facebook post, Heather, it was about last week, two years ago, that you guys stood in this pulpit and announced there was time to go. In two years of countless oil changes, you know, countless miles on your car, um, living with parents and in-laws and tight quarters, and I just, I, I think about it, and I just, let's just get to our scripture. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that your word would just penetrate our hearts today as your word teaches us. God, I pray that you would be the one who speaks. I pray that you would be the one who moves through me and I would fade into the background as your Holy Spirit ministers to the lives and hearts of people. In your name I pray. Amen. So beginning in verse 1 of Acts chapter 13. This, by the way, is the beginning of Paul's first missionary journey. I thought it was fitting for tonight. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, to te yeah, Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. You know, I love, I love how Ru Luke gives so many details. And if you've ever read Luke or Acts, you know Luke is a very detailed, meticulous man. And it's 
very fitting that he says, while they were worshiping and fasting, while their eyes were fixed on Jesus, while their eyes were put exactly where they needed to be, God led them where they were supposed to be going. And one of the things that I guarantee they could testify to you today is that they were not acting in their own selfish desires when they said, hey, we're going to leave this church and go to Curacao. Why? Because it's comfortable to stay. You have family. You have friends. You have a life. But if there's one thing is that I know as a follower of Jesus is that when your eyes are fixed on him, sometimes he tells you to step out of your comfort zone into the thing that is better for you and more importantly, better for his kingdom. And as we sang earlier tonight, when your eyes are, are fixed on Jesus and there's no turning back, there's nothing you won't do for him including leave everything that you know behind for something that you don't know. My favorite part about this is that God, <laughs> God and God alone is the one who calls us to these things. Because our own selfish desire says we've got to stay or we've got to go to the thing that's easiest for us. But again, it was while they were worshiping, while they were fasting. The first thing I want to highlight for us tonight is God is heard most clearly when we make him the strongest voice in our life. See, the, a lot of people say, we're, we're waiting for, I'm waiting for God to lead me, I'm waiting for God to guide me. But all you're doing is waiting and you're not taking steps to actually hear him. What were these, what were these people doing? They were worshiping. They were fasting. They were taking devoted time out of their life and saying, Listen, I know I got a lot going on, but my eyes are going to be fixed on what God has for me right now because I just, we need to know what's going on. And so my encouragement to you today, if you don't know what's going on, if you feel like there's a next step and you don't know what it is, you need to begin to take steps in your life. Maybe it's say, I'm going to take an hour because I, I only give right now five minutes of my day to Jesus, but I'm going to give an hour now. Maybe it's right now all I'm doing is praying. I'm finally going to open the word. I'm going to open my Bible and actually spend time and see where God leads me through it. Maybe it's I'm, I'm constantly hanging out with people who are leading me in a wrong direction. I'm going to surround myself with a group of believers who are going to encourage me on the path that I need to be put on. You see, the, they were worshiping and fasting. Their eyes were on Jesus. Their eyes were on his plan and what he desired. But it continues on in verse 4. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. Again, I, I love how Luke writes this because it doesn't just actually jump from one thing to the next. If you remember in verse 3, I'll read it again real quick. It said, so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And then in verse 4, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to... So, so, I don't know if you know this, but it probably didn't go like this. If we were all gathered in this room right now, and we're all praying and fasting and worshiping, and then the Holy Spirit showed up and said, hey, we're going to send... I want, I want these two to go. And then they just... We pray for them, and then they just get up and go. It, it doesn't happen like that. There was a time that went in between two years. Right now you laugh and you chuckle and you're, you know, you're putting on a smile and you're probably like, two years. <laughs> In a matter of two years, there's good days, there's bad days. There are days where you're like, God, did I actually hear from you? There are days where it's like, God, I don't understand why this is taking so long. Two years. But I just love how Luke writes it because Luke writes it not in the midst of what's actually taking place. He's writing it after the fact. Because in the, here's how I want to say it. God uses the time we are waiting to build our faith. He's using this time now to build your faith. Because if there's one thing I know about God's perfect timing is that it doesn't really seem perfect when you're waiting, right? Right? I mean, can we just be real? I mean, you're all in agreement here, but let's just be real. When you are waiting for God to move, it definitely doesn't seem perfect. And in fact, you probably would hope, I'm, I'm just going to be real. You probably look at God and be like, what's wrong with you? Why don't you get your act together, God? Don't you know what you're doing? This is obviously the best way for you to receive glory, God.
But the one thing I know about God's timing is that God's timing is not just based on your life, but it's based on their life. It's based on the person's life next to you. It's based on the people that you're going to meet next week. It's all of it. And God's perfect timing is working and orchestrating things that we don't understand. It's keeping us in places so that we can experience things that we wouldn't have experienced if we had left beforehand. I'm sure you have testimonies of that. I know you have testimonies of that. The waiting time is a time that God is going to use to build your faith. His timing is perfect, but it's your choice in how you're going to look at it as you walk through it. And the encouraging thing about, as I read how Luke wrote this, is that because he's writing it as historical, he's basing it off of accounts. Two years from now, these two years, you're just going to look at them as a blip on the radar. It may not even be two years from now. It may be months from now, and you're going to be like, you know what? Every one of those moments was worth it. Because God spoke something to me, and then he led me to it. The time in between, the waiting time, my faith grew, and I'm better off for it. Some of you in this room right now, you're waiting for that thing. You know, I think about David, who was anointed king, and then waited decades before he sat on a throne. I think about Joseph, who had a dream that he would be in authority over his brothers in some way. And he got thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, thrown into prison, forgotten before he finally found his place. That waiting time is the time that God builds your faith. And you have to wait. You have to trust in him because his timing is perfect. And if he's leading you to it, he's going to lead you through it as well. And that's the key right there, right? They knew. They knew just like you knew. When God speaks something over you, there are going to be days where circumstances and people are going to try to take it away from you. But if you know without a doubt in your mind what God has spoken, there's nothing that anybody could do to take it away. And there's nothing that's going to take you off your path. I don't care if my, my mom probably won't watch this, so I'll say it right now. When I got called into, mi- when I got called into ministry... I had laid out my path, and then God called me at an altar and said, hey, I want you to go into ministry. And my mom spent weeks, like three, telling me why it was a mistake. But I knew. Not even my own mom could tell me what she thought was best for me because I knew what God had spoken over me. Now, teenagers, if you try to do that to a parent, you better be darn sure And here's the other thing. I never dishonored my parent. I never dishonored my mom and how I handled it. And that is a fact. I've had moments where I didn't, but in that, I did not. (laughs) But again, your waiting time, when you finally reach that place, will just be a blip on the radar. And in fact, you'll look back on it with joy. Right now, it may be hard, but it's going to be worth it. Again, God uses the time we are waiting to build our faith for when we finally reach our destination. After all, it's not in the good times that we thrive, right? It's not in the good times that we grow, but it's in the hard times. It's the times where we're stretched. It's the times where we're growing. It's, the times, it's those times where everything, our back is against the wall, and we just have to fight and stand strong that we see God actually build our faith. And then when we finally reach that destination, when you finally reach Curacao, when you finally reach whatever that thing is you're waiting for, you're going to look back and understand why. It was worth it. But then there's one other thing. It continues on in verse 6. They traveled through the whole island. I love that it's an island, right? You know, it's just a different. Until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bargesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul. This is a high-ranking Roman officer. Ironic, since you just talked about a governor. This is perfect, right? (laughs) It's like the Holy Spirit led me. (coughs) Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, which is the same person, by the way, 
for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. And Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Back in verse 5, everything was simple. They preached the word of God. But in verse 8, we find what happens oftentimes in ministry, opposition. When we walk into these places of oppositions, when we have encounters with these people who try to take us off our place, these are spiritual battles. They're not just physical, they're not just things that we see, but there are things always taking place under what we actually see. And my favorite part about it is, again, the scripture just says it right there. We have to be able to take Paul's stance when he says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit and how he approached the problem. It's not a knowledge. It's not a plan. It's not a strategy. But it's a God empowering you through the Holy Spirit that will make the difference. And that's what leads me to all of us in this room. I told you I was going to be quick. I'm wrapping up here. As the Hembrees travel to Curacao, we must remember that it is not their personalities or their strengths that will have the greatest impact on reaching and teaching, but it will be the Holy Spirit moving through them. So tonight I not only charge the Hembry crew, but I charge us, us as a church and as a community. Why? Because if it's the Holy Spirit moving through them, then we have a part to play through prayer. Finances are one thing. And finances are great. That's what gets you there. It's what resources you. But the greatest resource we have, and I hate calling him a resource, is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not necessarily a tool we use, but it's only through him that we're able to accomplish the things that are actually of value in this life. And so my encouragement to you, church, which we're going to do here in a moment, is you need to be praying for them, not just tonight, you know, he has prayer cards some, right there. He has prayer cards there. You know, if you attend church here at Bethel Assembly, there are pictures on the wall. Mike, again, I told you guys on Sunday, when you walk out of church on Sunday, stop at the missions wall and pray over a missionary. Read the, read the newsletters that are on the metal wall. But tonight we're celebrating a specific missionary. We're praying for them daily. Why? Because it's going to be the Holy Spirit that moves through them. There are going to be days where they're going to feel weak. There are going to be days where they come against, against opposition that your prayer may make the difference. <sighs> supporting, again, supporting through finances are one thing, but finances are not what went over the proconsul. Finances don't make sorcerers stand down. But Jesus Christ alone, through his Holy Spirit, makes walls fall, seas part, bodies heal, relationships restore. And it's through Jesus and his Holy Spirit that men, women, children all find love, hope, peace, and ultimately salvation. Which is what it's all about. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes the difference. And the Holy Spirit will make the difference. <laughs> you know, one of the things that we've been talking about as a church is just focusing on that. It's just focusing on Jesus, focusing on the Holy Spirit. Because a lot of times, especially we as Americans, um, we try to think that we, we, we just struggle with pride, in case you didn't know that. We struggle with thinking that we can accomplish things on our own. Our very culture teaches us that you need to work for things yourself and get what you have coming to you. But if there's one thing I know about the gospel is that the gospel teaches that it's only through Jesus Christ, it's only through his Holy Spirit that we're able to do anything of significance anyway. So why don't we stop thinking that we're as strong as we are and we recognize how weak we are and how much we need the Holy Spirit. So church, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to close in prayer. Can we, pull, can we pull you guys up here? We're going we're gonna to pull you, and this is, I'm going to move this out of the way. Um, I'm going to have you guys just stand up right here in the, as a family on the front.
If I could get the board to come up and stand behind them. And wives. Whenever I say board in a church, I mean wives too. Sorry, Becky, you have to get up. <laughs> church, when we, t- when we talk about sending, what you have to do is you have to recognize that it's not just us as a church sending. Tonight we're all sending. Tonight we're all recognizing the fact that we're sending a family to a country that, yes, they may have visited, but they don't know. We're sending them to a place that, yeah, they understand, but they don't know everything they're going to come across. And so when we send them off tonight, we're sending them off in prayer. And what I'm gonna, this is what, what we're going to do here is we're going to have everybody pray. I'm not going to bring everybody up because we don't have enough room. But my encouragement to you tonight is this. When it's all over, if you want to pray with them specifically, then pray with them. I don't think they'll say no to that. When you walk up, because we're going to hang out here for a little while, when you walk up to them, when you speak over them, say thank you, when you send them off, say your goodbyes, your farewells, your see you soons, say, hey, can I pray with you? Don't hesitate to do that. If that's what God is laying on your heart to do that. But the way we pray here at Bethel Assembly right now, what we're going to do is we're all going to pray together. So I'm going to grab the mic. And um, if you can and are able to stand, if you would stand with me, if you would extend a hand, and um, let's go, yeah, let's just pass it around through the board members one at a time. Ryan and Donnie, if you guys don't want to, you don't have to, but it's your, I know you don't like microphones, but again, not everybody's going to pray into a mic, but everybody's praying. Does that make sense? So you pray, one of the things, again, I like making people uncomfortable. Use your voice. Speak it out loud. Why? Because if you speak something out loud, it means more to you because you're hearing it with your own ears. Speaking something in your mind, you can deceive yourself, but if you speak it out loud, you're speaking it in faith and you're speaking it in truth. So Doug's going to pray and other people will pray. I'll close this out in prayer, but we're all going to pray. This room will just be filled with the Holy Spirit and his presence as we send them off in prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for bringing the Hemrys back here to Bethel to spend time with us, to share with us, and for allowing us to be able to pray over them, to send them off with our great wishes. We ask you to watch over them. We ask that their missions trip be the most successful that anybody has ever seen. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you do. In Jesus' name. Father, we come to you right now, and we just want to say that we appreciate this family so much. God, our mind can go so many different directions here right now as our thoughts overwhelmingly take over. God, we just pray that your blessings would be upon them continuously. Lord, every need that they would have, you meet that need. Lord, every soul that would come to them, Lord, that you would send their way. God, let them speak word of life unto them. God, in the spirit we pray. Father, we believe you have called them. We believe that you have sent them. And now, Lord, we commission them here at Bethel to do the same. God, send them that way. Lord, send a harvest of souls. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God, thank you for the support and the blessings that you've let the Hembrys pour on us over the years. And please give them the guidance and continue to bless them as they give the support and guidance to all the other folks that they're about to impact as they travel on their missions trip. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for tonight. God, we thank you for the opportunity to just share this time together. God, we, it's, it's always nice to reminisce. It's always nice to reminisce about good times, God. Reminisce about the smiles that we shared, the laughs that we shared. But God, ultimately tonight is about what's to come. God, I pray for this family. God, I pray for Robbie and Scott, Lord God, walking into uh, this new culture, Lord Jesus. God, I pray that you would just be with them every step of the way, Lord God, that they, they would have friends, Lord God, that they would have people that would be able to pour into their life, not just their parents, Lord God, but they would just so fit in there, Lord Jesus, that they would be so full of joy, so full of life, Lord God, that there wouldn't be any detriment to this move, Lord God. God, I pray for Heather, Lord Jesus, and I pray for Jeremiah. God, I pray that you would strengthen them each and every 
every day. God, we thank you for speaking your truth over their life. God, for leading them by your Holy Spirit into this plan that you have. And God, I pray that you would empower them through your Holy Spirit to do mighty works. Lord God, that we would hear of miracles that take place because of their leadership, because of their ministry, Lord God. God, that it would be about children and lives being reached. God, we thank you already for the opportunities that are coming forward. God, knowing the governor of the of the country itself, Lord God, is such a blessing. And so, God, I pray for open doors all across the board, God, through the government, through the schools, God, through the churches, that everywhere they step foot, Lord God, that they would be shown favor by a man, God, ultimately because of the favor that they have with you. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just fill them with such a joy, God, fill them with such an encouragement of life, Lord God, that each day they wake up, they would know that they are in your will, that they are in your plan, and that there is nothing that the enemy can do to take that from them. Lord Jesus, I pray against the attacks of the enemy that I know will come. God, I pray that they would stand strong in their faith and they would look to you and that we as a church, Lord God, we as a community would say we will lift up the Hembrys each and every day knowing that lives are on the line. God, I pray that eternity, knowing that eternity is on the line each and every day for people in Curacao, Lord God, that we would be willing to stand not only behind financially, but stand with through prayer. God, we know it's going to be through you that lives are changed. And God, I pray that years from now when they come back to itinerate once again, God, that it's not two years. God, I, I pray for a quick turnaround when that time comes back. And God, I pray that each and every step that they take from here on out for the rest of their lives, God, would continue to be ordered by you and that, God, they would trust and know that it is you. God, your timing is always perfect. I may not seem it in the moment, but, God, I pray that you would encourage them in these coming weeks that they would know that every single blip, every single obstacle along this way, along this path that they've endured was totally worth it as it built their faith for the coming days. God, be with us tonight. God, I pray that you would bless the food, that we would eat it all because I'm not taking it home. And God, I pray that each person in this room would be able to hug a neck. God would be able to just share a laugh, share a smile with the Hembrys one last time before they head off to Curacao. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen, amen, and amen.